Hello and welcome to your online lecture for the course Altered Physiology 1 and this is the second lecture for the reproductive disorders content and what I have on the slide here is a summary of what we will be speaking about in more detail throughout today's lecture. Some main key terms that you need to be aware of. Let's first talk about sex hormone binding globulin or SHBG as you'll see it writ written. And this is referring to a protein. When you see globulin, we're referring to a protein. And the purpose of sex hormone binding globulin is to bind lipid soluble sex hormones for transport in the blood. And some examples of these lipid soluble uh, sex hormones would be estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, for instance. And, uh, this, these hormones that are bound to sex hormone binding hormone are not active and they're too large once they're bound to sex hormone binding globulin to leave the blood and, and travel to the tissue so they're considered not active. But hormones that are not bound to sex hormone binding globulin are considered to be active because they, they can actually leave the blood. And once they leave the blood, then of course they are able to have their effect on the target tissue. Now there is a, there's usually a normal amount of sex hormone binding globulin so that the amount of testosterone and estrogen and progesterone that leave the bloodstream and into the tissue is actually regulated. And there are some conditions that can cause this level to drop, the level of SHBG to drop. And when this happens, the level of free hormones free active hormones increase. So we see increased levels of unbound or free sex hormones. And again, these are active in the blood and they can easily make their way into the tissue because they're not bound to SHBG. And so it really overall ends up increasing the effect that these sex hormones have because of their ability to affect the tissues. Now let's move on to talk about gonadostat. This regulates the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone secretion. And the, this is done via a negative feedback mechanism like many uh, hormones, uh, as many hormones act. And the greater amount of gonadostat, the less amount of gonadotropin releasing hormone that's released. Okay, so the greater amount of gonadostat, the less amount of GnRH released. And in pregnancy, high estrogen levels cause gonadostat to decrease the release of GnRH, which then helps to promote and progress the pregnancy. Okay, let's move on to talk about what happens during puberty in females. Puberty usually begins between the ages of 8 and 12 years of age. And it begins when the gonads in the female are starting to produce more sex hormones. Now in females, puberty begins with breast development and it ends in sort of a physiological angle with the start of the first menstrual period. Now what happens during this time is an increase in the production of androgens. And an increase in the production of androgens is going to lead to the increase uh, conversion of androgens then to testosterone or estrogen. And you should be aware though that uh, androgens are weak sex hormones. So they become, ha they will have a stronger effect once they're converted into either testosterone or estrogen. During puberty, the gonad gonadostat sensitivity is decreased. And so this means that there are higher levels then of GnRH. And GnRH, if you recall, is released by the hypothalamus, okay? Released by the hypothalamus. And this increase in gonadotropin releasing hormone will then increase the levels of follicle stimulating hormone as well as luteinizing hormone. And this really begins a positive feedback system throughout puberty where you have uh, really high levels of gonadotropin releasing hormone and luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone and it's positive because higher levels will then just ultimately produce higher levels and this promotes a lot of the changes that you're going to, going to see occur during puberty. Once the first menstrual cycle begins though, then the hormones are going to settle into more of a rhythm. Let's just do a uh, brief 
review of the different cycles within our body. So here we have the ovarian cycle and we have the uterine cycle. And what I'd like to remind you of is, is what happens during the ovarian cycle is we have the development of the follicles and maturation of the follicles which will get to a point where a follicle has matured enough that it will be released from the ovary. And so that's the process here of ovulation. And then after ovulation, we enter, so from the follicular phase, we enter the luteal phase where we form the corpus luteum. And then should pregnancy occur, the corpus luteum will hang around for a little bit. But if pregnancy doesn't occur, as in most cases with ovulation, then we'll form a corpus albicans. I'd like to, you, to, you to be aware of the fact that at the point of ovulation, you're seeing that there is this increase in follicle stimulating hormone or, or a surge spike in follicle stimulating hormone as well as in luteinizing hormone, a much greater rise or a greater surge called the luteinizing surge, which is, is associated with ovulation. So we need to have this luteinizing surge for ovulation to occur. You can also see a peak in estrogen levels at this time as well. And then looking down here at the uterine cycle, what you can see is that as, uh, as the uterus thickens, we also have, and what contributes to that, is the... Uh, increased levels in progesterone, okay, so contributing to the thickening of the endometrium. And what this will do is will continue to thicken, preparing the body for a potential pregnancy. And then when pregnancy does not occur, then we end up with a uh, drop off in progesterone and then a drop off in the thickening of the uh, the uterus, which is what women experience as their menses. Okay, so that was just a brief overview. Now we're going to move on to talking about hormonal and menstrual alterations that can occur in women. First of all, the term dysmenorrhea or dysmenorrhea, dys refers to dysfunctional, menorrhea refers to menstruation, okay, so dysfunctional menstruation, and there's both primary and secondary types of dysmenorrhea. Primary dysmenorrhea and secondary dysmenorrhea both have painful menstruations associated with them. Looking now specifically just at primary, this is associated with prostaglandin release or PG, prostaglandin release in ovulation cycles. It is cyclical in terms of its uh, time of occurrence and it's related to the duration and the amount of menstrual flow that the person experiences. With secondary dysmenorrhea, this on the other hand is associated with pelvic pathology. And in terms of time of occurrence, it's there's something else, well, uh, sorry, for time of occurrence is any time during the menstrual cycle rather than being cyclical. but. In terms of pelvic pathology, there's something else that causes changes in the menstrual cycle, and that's a differentiating factor as well from primary dysmenorrhea. Okay, so looking a bit more at alterations in hormonal, uh, both related to hormonal and menstruation, hormones and menstruation, we have primary and secondary amenorrhea, a referring to without, and of course, um, menorrhea referring to menstruation. So this is lack of menstruation or without menstruation. So someone with primary amenorrhea would have absent menstruation by the age of 14 with no previous menstruation occurring. Some common causes include congenital, so for example, if you recall Turner's syndrome, uh, a chromosomal abnormality where uh, one of the effects is that women with Turner syndrome do not actually menstruate. Uh, and so if they don't menstruate, then they can't reproduce. It can also be hormonal, so in women that do not produce GnRH or luteinizing hormone or fo follicle stimulating hormones, so they cannot stimulate the production then of the menstrual cycle. And there can also be an anatomical defect such as congenital um, central nervous system defects or there can be uh, some sort of lesion, a CNS lesion, and there can also be an anatomical malformation that contributes to the lack of menstruation. And then we have secondary amenorrhea or amenorrhea. And the definition of this is it's that there's something else that causes lack of menstruation for a time that's equivalent to three or more cycles 
uh, or six months in women who have previously menstruated. Now, this one is not just related to disease or, or of some sort, but it can be related to the condition of pregnancy. Uh, of course, when you're, you're pregnant, you don't have your period. In addition to that, women who breastfeed can go a, a very long time without without menstruating. Some other causes include excessive weight loss. This might be due to mal uh, malnutrition or excessive exercise. So it's thought then to be related to a reduced amount of fat cells, okay, reduced amount of fat cells in that person. Other causes include pituitary tumors or ovarian tumors, which ultimately affect the amount of hormones that that person is able to produce. And not only ovarian tumors, but there's certain ovarian uh, conditions or cysts that can form, such as in the condition of PCOS or PCOS, which stands for uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail today. This here is just an overview slide. Uh, with amenorrhea or amenorrhea, something can go wrong that's related to the uterus, related to the ovaries, and related to the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. With the ovaries, you can see that there can either be high levels of gonadotropin, there can be high levels of ovarian hormone secretion, and the main, the main causes of uh, amenorrhea I discussed on the previous slide. So I do not expect you to know all of the details on here. Now let's speak about overly large ovaries, which can be due to the presence of cysts within the ovaries. And this can commonly occur during puberty but also menopause and that's because during these times there are larger changes in hormone levels that can end up having an effect and causing the development of cysts. These are, are benign functional cysts, functional being that it, it follows the cycle and it can increase and decrease in size then according to the cycle. It's usually unilateral, so it usually occurs on with one ovary rather than both, but they're largely asymptomatic and oftentimes they can be discovered sort of without, uh, unintentionally if somebody has an ultrasound for, for some other reason, they can, they, there can be a, almost an insignificant finding of these uh, ovarian cysts. Now there are two types of ovarian cysts that we will discuss. Remember that the ovarian cycle has both the follicular phase and the luteal phase and so because ovarian cysts can develop with your cycle and change with your cycle, we have both follicular cysts as well as corpus luteum cysts. So follicular cysts here, corpus luteum cysts here. Let's start with the follicular cysts. So normally we have a few follicles that start maturing every month. Okay, so we'll have a few follicles that start to, to mature, but only one generally dominates, uh, unless of course the female releases two eggs and uh, both are fertilized and she ends up with, with more than one, uh, more than one conception. But usually it's one that dominates and this one that dominates is usually the one that's released whereas the other ones that begin the process of maturation will just shrink and die off. But what can happen instead is that the dominant one either fails to rupture, so it, it dominates, the plan is to rupture and leave the, the ovary, but it doesn't. Uh, so meaning that ovulation doesn't occur of this mature egg. The other situation is that the non-dominant non follicles that have, uh, have matured, but they're not dominating, they should shrink and die off, but instead they fail to do this. So they remain as are within the ovaries. And so this can cause the ovary to continue to enlarge. The other type of cyst is called a corpus luteum cyst. Remember that these are the remnants of the mature follicle that the re that released the oocyte. So here we have the graphene follicle that releases its oocyte. And then that graphene follicle will then start to change and become the corpus luteum and then degrade into a corpus albican. Now normally if a woman does not become pregnant then the corpus luteum will form but then degrade as I said into the corpus albican. Now with a corpus luteum cyst 
the corpus luteum hangs around and it continues to, and it fills with blood. And this is what's called an intracystic hemorrhage. And eventually it will fill with enough blood that, that it will rupture. These are less common types of ovarian cysts. And as you can imagine with rupturing, they can not only lead to a lot of bleeding, but a lot of pain that accompanies it as well. I briefly mentioned polycystic ovarian syndrome uh, a few slides ago, also known as PCOS or PCOS. And when you see poly, it refers to more than one, and uh, cystic referring to a cyst, and of course ovaries relating to the ovaries, so cysts within the ovaries. And it is the leading cause of infertility in the United States. And you can see here on an ultrasound, this is an ovary, and you can see the presence of many cysts in this particular ovary. In order to be diagnosed with this condition of, of PCOS, you need to have two of the following signs. A woman needs to have a dysfunctional menstruation, which might include anovulation, so not ovulating, or oligoovulation, so infrequent ovulations. A woman, uh, another feature would be increased levels of androgens. And remember, androgens are produced by the adrenal cortex of the kidney. And blood tests can be done to uh, confirm that the person has increased level, levels of androgens. And although we're not speaking about it on this uh, during this lecture, there's also clinical signs of hyperandrogenism, so increased amounts of androgens. And more than one cyst in the ovary. Okay, so one cyst uh, is not enough. It would have to be greater than one cyst. But what's interesting is that you don't need to be diagnosed with having really any cysts in order in order to be diagnosed with with PCOS because you may have the presence of these two signs here. Okay, let's move on now to talk a bit more about PCOS in terms of what causes it. PCOS is a multifactorial condition in terms of its cause, and we'll talk about some of the different contributors to that now. One contributor is from hyperinsulinism, glucose intolerance, insulin resistance, uh, so relating to insulin, relating to glucose, and I, I'm sure as you see this, you're thinking a little bit of, of diabetes type two. So if the body has, high, has a high level of insulin it will stimulate the ovaries to produce androgens. This leads to ovarian damage. The second thing it does is it reduces the amount of sex hormone binding globulin. And with a reduction in the amount of this globulin, then we know that there are gonna be increased levels of active sex hormones in the blood. In addition, there's gonna be suppression of follicle apoptosis. So instead of the follicles dying off like they should, they, they survive and we end up uh, producing cysts. The other, uh, another uh, feature that's important to be aware of is that 30% of women with PCOS will will develop uh, diabetes, and that makes sense given given these factors here. So another contributor is the increased levels of androgen as caused by hyperinsulinism and the decrease in sex hormone binding globulin. So if there is an inc if there is increased levels of androgen, then some of these androgens are gonna be converted into testosterone. There is also the decrease of sex hormone binding globulin, which I already told you, but this can lead to an increase in the amount of active sex hormones, which you're already aware of. In addition though, there, there will be excessive levels of luteinizing hormone and when you have excessive levels of this hormone present, what you end up not having is a luteinizing hormone surge. So if we go back a few slides, it is, it, the presence of luteinizing hormone does not allow for ovulation. It's the surge of the hormone that contributes to ovulation. So if you have a consistently high amount, then you don't end up having that surge that leads to ovulation. And in addition to that, there's higher levels of follicle stimulating hormone. And with this, we end up with continued development of the follicles because of the follicle stimulator hormone instead of these hormones dying as they should through, uh, through normal shrinking and dying off. And then the last 
feature or factor contributing to PCOS is dyslipidemia. And dyslipidemia is abnormal amounts of blood lipids or lipids in the blood. And usually, usually these levels are seen high rather than low. Okay, so dyslipidemia just means abnormal amounts of lipids within the blood. But in cases of PCOS, although some individuals might have low amounts of these blood lipids, in majority of cases, these lipids are high. So 40% of people with PCOS are obese, uh, not, not always, but a decent percentage of them. And the excessive amounts of lipid that are in the blood can actually lead to an increase in the production of sex hormones, in particular ones that are uh, made from lipids. I won't be going over this slide during the lecture because it is an overview of what I already spoke about, but uh, you should go over this yourself to make sure that you understand the process and the pathway. Now we'll speak about pelvic inflammatory disease or PID and this is something that I brought up a couple of times during Reproductive 1 lecture, but now we'll elaborate on what it is. It is a, an acute inflammatory disease within the female pelvic organs, so specifically referring to the uterus, the fallopian or the uterine tubes, and the ovaries, caused by infection, oftentimes by bacterial infection. And it's referred to as an ascending infection because it will begin in the cervical region and then it will move its way up into the uterus and then move its way through the fallopian tubes and can make its way then to the ovaries. We have a couple of different types of inflammation that can be seen. Somebody can have salpingitis, which is inflammation of the fallopian or ovarian tubes. I should say, uh, that should actually say uterine tubes. And you can have oophoritis, which is inflammation of the ovaries. And remember that itis refers to inflammation. And oftentimes people with pelvic inflammatory disease are asymptomatic, but it can cause abdominal pain. Women can experience pain during certain activities such as sexual intercourse. And when women consistently do report pain with sexual intercourse, there is a possible chance that she has pelvic inflammatory disease. So it may be part of the uh, testing at that point. You can see in this diagram here that one of the things that, that forms are adhesions. So you can see all of these adhesions that are really preventing proper movement of these organs. And so if we have the cervix here and the cervix moves for whatever reason, so in the case of sexual intercourse, there will be movement of the cervix upwards, then you can imagine why a person would experience pain because this, these adhesions are preventing it, but sexual intercourse is still forcing it upwards. These adhesions are actually referred to as violin string adhesions. Okay, so in symptomatic women that develop these adhesions, they will oftentimes have some sort of pelvic or abdominal pain from it. Hopefully you can recall from the Reproductive Disorder Lecture 1 that pelvic inflammatory disease can be caused by sexually transmitted infections that involve polymicrobial, polymicrobes. Uh, we had spoken about chlamydia and gonorrhea specifically as potentially causing PID, either chlamydia or gonorrhea on their own or both of them if the person is unfortunately suffering from infection of, of both. Complications include uh, in, in, a, in about 15 to 25% of people, they may experience infertility. And the reason for infertility is that scarring and blockage of the fallopian tubes can occur. In a, a small percentage, death from septic shock from this infection can occur. Peritonitis, we've spoken about peritonitis before. In this case, a pelvic organ can have some sort of degree of rupture that end up infecting, based on content release, the abdominal cavity. And you can also have the formation of tubal or ovarian abscesses. Now we'll move on to speak about pelvic relaxation disorders. This is something that I spoke about a little bit in class when we discussed the urinary system. Women have a pelvic floor, so you can think of the floor as being kind of in around this region here. And the floor consists of endopelvic fascia and perineal muscles. And the purpose of these structures is to support the bladder, 
the urethra, and the rectum. But with aging, but also from trauma, childbirth being a big one, pelvic floor surgery and pelvic nerve damage, the, the muscular uh, fascia, the muscles and the fascial tissue lose their normal tone and lose their normal strength. And when they lose this tone and strength, they're unable to support the structures above it and around it. And you can see here the color coding. We have the, uh, in red, the reproductive parts. In yellow, we have the urinary. And in green, the digestive or uh, more specifically, not digestive as much as um, rectum and anus. So part, the end part of the intestines. And so if the pelvic floor is not strong enough to support these structures here, then what happens is these structures end up moving from their original position elsewhere. One of the things that can be done to help prevent this is Kegel exercises. And the, the thing with Kegel exercises is most people don't do these exercises correctly. So it's important to, to speak to somebody, some sort of healthcare provider that's aware of how to do these exercises properly so that you're, you're doing them properly. And really what you're doing with these exercises is working on strengthening your pelvic floor. And a stronger pelvic floor is less likely to relax and relax enough that it impacts the other organs. Especially women who have just had babies after childbirth, the pelvic floor is just naturally weaker as you can imagine with delivering a baby. But provided the woman does Kegel exercises appropriately during her pregnancy as well as afterwards, there is a very good chance that her pelvic floor will return to close to being normal if not normal. One thing I'd like to point out here is that the opening the anal sphincter, the vaginal orifice, as well as the urethral opening are all in very close proximity to one another. And all of these systems that I spoke about relating to relating to the end part of the digestive system, relating to the reproductive region here, and relating to the urinary system, all of these areas through here are in close proximity, so um, they, they can have quite an impact on each other if they're not supported properly. Okay, we'll spend a few minutes talking about specific pelvic relaxation disorders. Some of them I've already spoken to you about in class during urinary disorders lecture. The first one is a cystocele, and a cystocele is where the bladder actually collapses into the vaginal canal. Women will often describe it as feeling like they're sitting on a ball, something is there that shouldn't be, that feeling, and it can be intensified by coughing, sneezing, and vigorous exercise because when, when you cough and you sneeze, you increase intra-abdominal as well as intrapelvic pressure that can force the uh, cystocele to worsen at least during that moment. So it, there's an increase in symptoms at that time. Urethrocele is where the urethra loses its tone and it starts to sag. And then, as you can imagine, that could impact uh, impact the urinary proper urinary function. And usually, if people have a urethrocele, they also have a cystocele. Rectocele we spoke about as well. This is where the rectum actually collapses into the vaginal wall uh, as well. And sometimes people will experience all of these or just one on its own. An enterocele, this is a recto, where the rectouterine pouch herniates into the rectovaginal septum, usually seen in, in women who are grossly obese and the elderly as well. And here's an example of an enterocele here where part of the small bowel, so now we're talking about the uh, the more upper part of the bowel has prolapsed where it shouldn't be versus a rectocele which is specific to the rectum. And then lastly, uterine prolapse. This is where the cervix and or the uterus is going to prolapse into the vagina and we'll speak about that on the next slide. Okay, so let's talk about the different degrees of cystoceles and rectoceles. And you can see here with a cystocele, and just orient yourself, this would be posterior and this would be anterior. Here you can see the bladder, the uterus, and the rectum. And you can see how all those openings are so close together and all of those systems are so close together. 
And what can happen with a cystocele is the bladder wall here, this is supposed to be the vagina, but the bladder wall has collapsed then into the vaginal canal and uh, narrowing this lumen and it can actually fall enough out, if it, if it drops enough down, it can actually protrude slightly out of the vagina. So this is looking at it more end on and in a real life example here where the bladder is actually prolapsed out of the body. So this is considered a grade two prolapse and a grade four is where it's uh, prolapsed out of the body. And a rectocele, you can see here the rectum has prolapsed into the vagina. So if you compare it to normal here, and you can also compare the prolapsed bladder to the normal bladder. So when the, the rectal wall falls into and prolapses into the vagina, similar presentation except the bulge here is actually the rectum, whereas the bulge here is the bladder. And you can see here, this is a rectum that's prolapsed right out of the vagina uh, and there's been ulcer formation on uh, within that area as well. And sorry, it was the, not the next slide, but the slide after that where I was going to elaborate on uterine prolapse. And again, this is where the cervix and or the uterus descend into the vagina. Now, when I say and or, I'm going to elaborate on that a little bit. So this right here would be the cervix. Let me get a pointer. This here is the cervix and this here is the uterus. So sometimes the cervix itself can drop down low um, but the uterus is still relatively okay in terms of its its position. But what can happen is if it can be more than just the cervix dropping down, the entire cervix and the uterus can drop down. So you can see the different stages here. This would be normal and you can see the bladder, the uterus is flexed over almost at a right angle degree to the bladder and that's normal when a woman is not pregnant. And then here you can see that we've begun our descent through the vagina and in stage two, further descent, almost flush with the opening of the vagina. And then in stage four, the uterus is actually completely prolapsed, not completely, but has prolapsed out of the body. And what can happen, there's a lot of people who live with stage one without any major complications and, and during sexual intercourse, they have to begin very slow because the uterus actually needs to be kind of pushed up and out of the way and if it happens too aggressively it can be uh, can be very uncomfortable and even cause some bleeding from shearing of tissues in the area and actually women who have even first and who have first and second stage uterine prolapse with any form of straining, so with bowel movements, they have to be very careful with constipation or other forms of straining, anything to increase pressure within this region, the uterus will start to prolapse even more and kind of go up and when pressure is increased, it goes down. When pressure is decreased, it goes back up and through that up and down movement, it can cause shearing of tissues in the area, which can lead to some light spotting uh, in between uh, menstrual cycles. And one other thing actually I'd like to mention is that women that ha suffer from any pelvic floor prolapse, if it's severe, of course, surgical correction is necessary, but for ones that are not severe or maybe somebody's not a candidate for surgery, they can have what's called a, I mentioned this in class, a pessary ring inserted that is put up, fitted for them, and expands to hold up the pelvic floor. But of course that's not a... Uh, not necessarily a long-term, and it's not a fix either. It's it's just to uh, help help it kind of in the meantime until that person can have it surgically corrected. Okay, so let's talk about some disorders of the uterus. We're going to match these terms with their appropriate definition. Uh, leomyoma. Whenever you see myo, remember we're referring to muscle. A leomyoma is a benign tumor of the myometrium. Benign tumor of the myometrium. And remember that the myometrium is that thick muscle of the uterine wall of the uterus, so that would be this muscle here. So a leoma is a tumor that forms within this region. Endometriosis, we'll talk about this in more detail soon, is the presence of a functioning of functioning endometrial, endometrial tissue outside of the uterus. And key word there is functioning and, and you'll understand why shortly. So it's really where 
tissue, endometrial tissue is found in areas other than the uterus, which is where it's supposed to be. And functional is that it will go through menstruation, even if it's located in a different area of the body. And then the last one is an endometrial polyp. We'll speak about all these shortly in more detail, but this is a benign mass of endometrial tissue joined by a stem or stalk to the uterus. Okay, in terms of pathogenesis of endometriosis, and again, just to remind you on the previous slide that endometriosis is the presence of functioning endometrial tissue outside of the uterus, and it responds to hormonal fluctuations of the menstrual cycle, which I already briefed you on, and what that means is that if you have a piece of endometrial tissue located in the abdominal region, it will you will, when your hormones are, when progesterone levels start to drop off, then that tissue will shed blood. So you're having a, experiencing menstruation in areas other than your uterus. And as you can imagine, the buildup of blood when this happens, because it has nowhere to go, it's not exiting the body as it normally would during menstruation from the uterus, uh, it can end up leading to quite a lot of pain in some of these these individuals. Up to 15% of women of reproductive age may have some degree of endometriosis and, and some may not even be aware of it, but others can. And, and some degree is referring to the fact that you can have endometrial tissue in many different areas or you can have large amounts of it in one area depending on the person. It is a frequent cause of pelvic pain as well as a frequent cause of infertility. Some of the possible causes of endometriosis, so how does how did this tissue get in other places to begin with? One of them is retrograde menstruation, which means that menstrual blood that contains endometrial cells or endometrial tissue flows back up through the fallopian tubes and into the pelvic cavity or you know some other area instead of flowing out of the body as it should. Uh, so the, another cause is it can spread through vascular or lymphatic systems in the area. So the tissue or the cells can be carried to other areas of the body. And it doesn't have to be in the pelvic region. There's been reported cases of people having endometrial tissue in their nose. Um, not as frequently though. A stimulation of multi, a multipotential epithelial cells on reproductive organs. So that just means that cells can develop into endometrial tissue. Depressed T cells, uh, TC cells tolerate ectopic tissue. This means that uh, T cells that are depressed can tolerate the presence of ectopic tissue. Uh, ectopic tissue, just referring to tissue that's out of its normal location. And then in addition to that, there can be some sort of genetic predisposition to this. So if, you're, if a mother has it, uh, it is possible that, that it can be passed on to their child, their female child. So on here, continuing with endometriosis, you can see this. these black areas are representing different areas that endometrial tissue can find itself. It's not specific to this area. This is just to give you an example. So sometimes, as I told you, it can be asymptomatic, where if you have a couple of different areas, I mean, if you have endometrial tissue here, you might not even notice that, that you did. Uh, and in other cases, however, in those that are symptomatic, menstruation can be very abnormal, it can be heavy, it can be very painful. People can have pain during urination, uh, before or during menstruation, they can have pain during intercourse. They can develop urge incontinence, so that constant feeling that they have to urinate. And then not having control over it, that's where incontinent comes from. And they can also have difficulty, unfortunately, with, with getting pregnant. And keep in mind that the pain that they experience may not just be in this region. It can be anywhere that the bleeding occurs. Okay, let's move on to talk about uterine or endometrial polyps. These are uh, benign masses of endometrial tissue that's joined by a stem or stalk to the uterus. So you can think of it as endometrial tissue that's kind of hanging on to the uterus by a stem. There are a couple of different types. Uh, and by the way, these, these polyps can bleed. We have intermenstrual polyps and functional polyps. In intermenstrual polyps 
is where you'll see bleeding between menstrual cycles. So women may present to their doctor and say, I'm bleeding when it's not even my period and it's possible that they have a polyp that, that is causing that. And then there are also functional uh, functional polyps and in the case of functional polyps, these the key with these is that they're always out of phase with the menstrual cycle. And risk factors include hypertension, obesity, uh, hyperestrogenetic states. Uh, hyperestrogenetic states mean that you're, the person is ha at periods of time has excessively increased levels of estrogen in their body. Okay, let's talk about leomyomas. These are the most common, uh, most common benign tumor of the uterus. They're also referred to as uterine fibroids, which is a term you've probably heard of before, especially females, and myomas. They develop from smooth muscle of the uterus. Remember this, the uterus is a smooth muscle, and that's the myometrium, the muscular component. And it can lead to pain and abnormal bleeding, along with pressure. And the reason for pressure is because its presence can put pressure on other structures or nearby structures. It's usually located in uh, three different regions which are identified up here. It can be uh, the submucosal region, it can be intramural, so within the wall, and it can be subserosal. And so these are the three different common locations that uterine fibroids can, can find themselves. And they are usually, leomyomas are usually estrogen and progesterone sensitive, so it, it occurs oftentimes during the reproductive years, or will occur during the reproductive years. And risk factors include, they could be hereditary, um, nulli parity, which means never being pregnant, so a woman who's never been pregnant has an increased risk of developing these uterine fibroids. PCOS, diabetes, and hypertension are all risks for the development of uterine fibroids or leomyomas. So we're moving on now to endometrial cancer, so cancer of the endometrium, and this usually occurs in postmenopausal women, and it's usually caused by an increase in the amount of estrogen, and that increase in the amount of estrogen can lead to endometrial hyperplasia. Some other potential risk factors for the development of endometrial cancer include obesity, include the presence of other cancers, such as colon, rectum, or breast cancer, nulli paris, which we know means uh, not being able, or not having had children. And another one which, was, which is interesting is the use of the drug tamoxifen. So tamoxifen is an estrogen receptor antagonist. You can think of it as anti-estrogen. And it's usually given, given to women who have estrogen sensitive tumors such as breast cancer in order to try and stop the growth of the tumor. But these women need to be warned that if they decide to go on this drug tamoxifen to reduce the growth of their breast cancer tumor, it could potentially predispose them to development of endometrial cancer. Okay, so they need to be warned about that in advance. So really a key factor here is that a risk factor for endometrial cancer is mainly unopposed estrogen exposure with resultant hyperplasia. So too much estrogen that isn't opposed and it ends up causing hyperplasia of the, uh, of the endometrium some protective factors, so experiencing delayed puberty, so starting puberty a little bit later, being pregnant or having multiple pregnancies, as well as using uh, combined or progestin-only contraceptives will actually protect someone or contribute to protecting them against, against developing endometrial cancers. And with this contraceptive here, and I mean really with all of these, it's all about controlling or opposing too much estrogen within the body. As we know, unopposed estrogen can lead to hyperplasia of the endometrium, which can end up leading to cancer. Still on endometrial cancer, it's the most prevalent uh, gynecological malignancy. Common clinical manifestations include abnormal vaginal bleeding, 
Diagnosis is done through direct sampling of the affected tissue, so through biopsy. You can also measure the endometrial thickness to see if this hyperplasia is occurring, and which we had talked about before. Uh, the endometrial hyperplasia. And so women that may be predisposed to developing endometrial cancer could have their endometrial wall uh, measured, but measurement of endometrial thickness can, can be a sign potentially of endometrial cancer. And transvaginal ultrasound is also done to assist with diagnosis. Treatment includes surgery, chemotherapy, uh, radiation, and the use of progestins, which we spoke about. We saw that word over here, which again are really to decrease the amount of estrogen or um, allow for estrogen opposing. You can see here the five-year survival rate. So women who are diagnosed early with endometrial cancer, their five-year survival rate is not quite 100%, but over 90%, whereas late diagnosis is still a decent prognosis, uh, but uh, just over 60% five-year survival rate. So it doesn't seem to drop off as much as some other cancers would. Okay, now on to ovarian tumors, speaking about ovarian cancer. So malignant ovarian tumors actually cause more death than any other female reproductive cancers. Uh, this is a nasty one. They are adenocarcinomas, so they're epithelial cells. The, it's uh, a cancer of the epithelial cells in terms of its origin. Risk is reduced with an ovulation, and what that means is that when a woman does not ovulate um, all the time, or there's periods in her life where she's not ovulating, there is a reduction in her risk of developing ovarian tumors. So for example, a woman who's pregnant or a woman who's breastfeeding will go a, long, uh, a longer period than someone who you know, isn't pregnant or isn't breastfeeding without ovulating. And because generally, of course, the pregnancy, you don't release an egg, but with breastfeeding, you oftentimes can go upwards of 10 months or, or two years without, without ovulating. And that's very dependent on the person, but that does decrease risk of development of ovarian cancer. It usually spreads intra-abdominally over the peritoneal surface, so really outside of the abdominal cavity. And, uh, sorry, like kind of outside and over the abdominal cavity. And unfortunately with ovarian cancer, it's oftentimes asymptomatic until it's quite progressed. And then once it is progressed, people will present with pain, uh, ascites where they actually look six, seven months pregnant, anorexia, early satiety, so feeling full faster than normal, and uh, consistent upset stomach as well as constipation. Another thing that can happen with ovarian tumors is the tumor itself can obstruct normal vasculature or normal vascular function. And when normal vasculature is obstructed, it can lead to the term that we're aware of, which is venous thrombosis. And then you can see a couple of different diagrams here. Okay, now Speaking of ovarian cancer risk factors, we'll discuss the both the risk factors, but we'll also talk about the protective factors. And really what it comes down to is, in terms of risk, is prolonged estrogen exposure. Let's look over to some of the protective factors. I already told you about this, but the suppression of ovulation. So an ovulation seen with pregnancy, it's seen with breastfeeding, and it's seen with combined or progestin-only contraceptives where you're, so uh, birth control medication. In terms of risk factors, you can see that the, uh, many of the risk factors are similar to that of uterine cancer. So we have postmenopausal age, family history of cancers, personal history of cancers, um, never having a child or having your first child over the age of 30, obesity. There's also mutation of, of a breast cancer susceptibility gene uh, that can cause ovarian cancer in these individuals. So interesting, interesting link, as well as increased exposure to hormones. And of course, that's the, the big one with respect to estrogen in particular that we have spoken about. Sometimes this happens because a, a female experiences puberty early, so she's exposed to the hormones for a longer period throughout her life, and then late menopause as well, so exposed to hormones uh, for much longer in life. Uh, there's also the exposure of hormones due to fertility treatment, 
uh, so constantly being exposed to these hormones but not actually getting pregnant. Here's the staging of ovarian tumors. I won't spend too long on this slide, but stage one is growth that's limited at this point to the ovaries. Then it's going to be begin its spread with stage two. With stage three, you're gonna get continued spread. And with stage four, distant metastasis. And sometimes people don't experience many symptoms until they have this distant metastasis or at least stage three. And with ovarian tumors, they are considered to be recurrent. So even if the person has completion of treatment where it appears that there's, uh, they've got things under control, the cancer can, can recur. What you can see here is a woman that looks like she's pregnant, but unfortunately this is a case of ascites due to ovarian cancer. And then this is showing you some different distant uh, spreads that can occur. We spoke about cervical cancer a little bit in, during our first reproductive lecture, as well as speaking about HPV, which stands for human papillomavirus. And this is common in, uh, f fairly common cancer in women. Screening can be done through pap smears, and that's why appropriate amount of pap smears throughout your life is very important to uh, detect if there's been any changes to the cervix cells or the cells of the cervix that could predispose someone to developing cancer. Risk factors, the main one of developing cervical cancer is HPV, which is why we're focusing on it. But HIV as well as multiple sexual partners and exposing yourself to certain diseases can cause the development of cervical cancer as well. So here are the stages or the progression of cervical cancer and what's important to be aware of is that stage one you don't actually have cancer. Stage one is considered almost pre-cancer. It's where cervical dysplasia is identified and this is where your pap, pap tests are, are very important. And what happens with stage one is you're ranked according to uh, you're, according to CIN, which stands for cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. And so you can see here, looking at the different changes, we have normal cervix here. Here's CIN1, CIN2, and CIN3, and you can see the differences in dysplasia of the tissue, and, and here's showing you um, more looking at the cells itself. And here we have quite a lot of dysplasia that has occurred, which can progress then to cancer. Once you're, if you have a stage two diagnosis, then it's the actual cancer, a cervical cancer in C2, so the cancer is uh, where it is in the cervix at, rather than invading. And then stage three is once the carcinoma, the cervical carcinoma has um, become invasive. And on our last slide here, a little bit more about HPV. It can be, uh, it's it's a sexually can be uh, transmitted as a sexually as a sexual disease from uh, sexual intercourse because it is an STI as we've spoken about both in women and men it can cause cervical cancer in women because women have a cervix in men it can actually cause cancer as different types of cancer as well but of course not particular to the cervix since they don't have one there is no cure but most are spontaneously cleared by our immune system so we're able to uh, clear it off itself in other words most cancers do not progress to being a carcinoma in C2 or becoming invasive. We spoke about two different types or four different types of strains of HPV in our last class and how HPV 6 and 11 can cause genital warts which are known as condylomas and these are contagious so somebody that has genital warts can fairly easily pass this on to another person that they have sexual intercourse with. HPV strains 16 and 18 I had spoken about how these as both 16 and 18 strains are high risk oncogenic strains, meaning that they can cause cancer and they can cause dysplasia, which then can lead to cancer. And what's interesting is a woman may actually have several strains of HPV. She doesn't necessarily just have 16, she could have multiple strains. But what's very interesting is these statistics here in that 90% of people who are sexually active have HPV. 50% of adolescents and young women contract HPV within three years of being sexually active. 
Uh, so it, there can be 50% of, of young people that have been having sexual intercourse can contract this virus. And 25% of adolescents and young women, so uh, one in four, are going to contract it within three months of being sexually active. So those statistics are, are rather alarming and uh, yes, quite, quite scary. And then the very final thing to mention to you is, you can see the term here, cholecystosis, and this is, this is the presence of um, cholecystosis, is the presence of these cholecysts within the tissue when it's looked at microscopically. That's the end of today's lecture. Thank you for listening.